My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. I'll be with my friends. I'm just trying to make a little money. My job, not just to entertain, but to educate, teach. Call me 1-800-743-CBC. Tweet me at Jim Kramer. It's too darn hot. It's too darn hot. And unlike Cole Porter, we have a Fed chief who doesn't like it hot. He's trying to chill things down to get it so, baby, it's cold outside. And that's what Jay Powell did today when he raised interest rates by 50 basis points and said there could be many more hikes to come, noting that rates are going to have to stay high for a while. So then why did the market more or less hang in there? Why didn't we plummet on the news? Instead of the Dow finishing off just 142 points, this would be slipping 0.61%. NASDAQ, of course, losing 0.76%. NASDAQ, so pathetic. Simple. Because most money managers in this country saw it coming. They know Jay Powell's right. They, they know we still don't have inflation under the control. They've been in the supermarket. they braced themselves for more pain. They know what the bonus situation looks like. Yes, we've seen some declines in raw commodities, including oil. Yes, we had the beginning of a peak in some of the consumer price index components yesterday. Uh, used cars, gasoline. But we don't have much else under control. And let's face it, we've had nearly two years of elevated price increases. So Powell's not going to stop until he rolls a lot of that back. Above all, above all else, even after a year of massive rate hikes, the Fed's made almost no progress on the most important kind of inflation, which is wage inflation. And it's a real problem, most important of problems, because that's what they care about the most. Wage inflation, we keep... We keep acting, oh, well, maybe like, they'll be happy because gasoline at the pump is this or rents or that. No, that wage inflation is the issue. It's not that he wants people to make less money. It's that wage inflation is systemic, it's endemic, and it fuels inflation in all categories. As Powell said today, there are roughly 4 million more jobs than there are workers in this country, and until there's less of a mismatch, it's, he can't stop tightening. He just can't. Now, there's always a cohort of people who are just completely dead wrong about these things. <laughs> They expect Powell to say something somehow contrary to what he's been talking about, uh, something about how prices have come down, so why not just ease up? House of pleasure. Those are the ones who panicked <laughs> and blew out of stocks immediately, sell, 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 sell. sending the market down big initially, betting that others would follow in the footsteps, even though the Fed couldn't have telegraphed this move any more clearly, could it? They were making a bet. They were making a bet that other traders would see the decline and then freak out. I know where they're coming from because I've done that myself. I read a statement, I thought it was too hawkish, listen to the Fed chief, I thought it was too tough, and was glad to exit the building. Who needs that kind of risk? But that kind of panic only makes sense when the Fed takes us by surprise. Still, I have no doubt there will be more people bolting from stocks tomorrow morning, believing they've been given a tremendous opportunity to get out well ahead of when things accelerate to the downside. I think they're being too frantic. They need to understand the dilemma that Pal finds himself in. It's one that you and I would find ourselves in. We'd probably be doing exactly what he's doing. First, there's the problem that key portions of inflation remain persistent. Take housing. I like to look at stocks. You know that, not the individual numbers from the government. And if you look at the housing stocks, they're starting to trend up. That's just not part of the Fed's program. Worse, housing prices are holding up. Mortgage rates are actually coming down. The home builders are doing spectacularly. Their margins have been sensational, better than almost any time I can remember. If you're on the Fed, that's a disaster. They want to see mortgage rates up. They want to see margins down. So the home builders have, home builders have to cut price in order to get rid of excess inventory. That's not easy because we don't have enough workers or enough plots of land even that have been environmentally committed to being able to build up build homes so we don't get all the new homes we need. You know, the industry's a lot smarter than it used to be, too. Uh, they uh, don't overbuild like they used to. And that's why Powell has to take some action. He needs more apartments, more rentals, and more homes, all of which take time. He has to play for time, taking us to a place where mortgage rates are so high that demand dries up and housing prices collapse. Of course, no one in the business wants that, except for the people who want a place to live. 
Fortunately, the Fed sided with the renters and prospective home buyers, and the Fed's got all the ammo. Now, I did gulp when I saw the housing stocks go higher over the last few weeks, while the mortgage rates came back down. The Fed has trillions of dollars in bonds on its balance sheet. I actually wish it would just sell a lot of, I don't know, a lot of 10 to 20 year paper in order to raise long term rates so mortgages get even more expensive. Powell also needs all these big repositories of rented homes, like those that Blackstone owns, to be cut to come down enough so that they'll be sold. He won't quit raising rates until that happens. Now, Lenore, big home builder, missed on its numbers tonight, and it barely went down. Now, it's bad for the Fed. We'll see what they say tomorrow. But you need, if you're the Fed, you actually, unfortunately, for people who own stock in Lenar, need their shares to go down, too. Then there's the problem of the tight labor market, which is a big one. We asked, remember, we asked Young last night, is it still tight? They said, no, it's getting better. But that, they may be the exception. Even after all these darn rate hikes, there are still way too many jobs chasing way too few people. The reverse of what it's been more, all my life, which means wages are going higher. Powell can't create a surfeit of labor. He can't change the immigration laws so that foreign students who get engineering degrees here, plenty, many do, can stay here. He certainly can't open our borders or get immigration to look the other way when people come here illegally. So what does he do? If Powell felt that things weren't go, going his way, now, I got to tell you, what he would have done, he's hit us with another 75 basis point rate hike, not a 50. He didn't do that because he knows we're making progress. He doesn't want to do too much damage to the economy and cause unnecessary bankruptcies. And that's pretty much where we are in the next four weeks. If Powell takes his time and tightens a little more slowly, then more people might be forced back into the workforce as they go through their savings. While more digitization will obviate the need for workers. I'm trying to be a little critical here. It doesn't sound good, but I tell it like it is. That can't happen overnight. So many companies are blindsided by the speed of the recovery that they keep expanding. Powell needs them to cut that out. So what does he do? He raises the price of credit. And anything big that you need to do with expansion needs credit. Of course, it isn't easy to slow down an economy that is just desperate for workers, especially when the federal government is creating more jobs than any other time since the Johnson administration or possibly even World War II. Thanks to the Infrastructure Bill and the CHIPS Act and the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, we're about to create tons of highly skilled jobs that will make the cost of employment in construction skyrocket. And we don't have the people to fill those jobs. We just don't. Even if housing goes lower, we don't have those people. Why didn't Congress think about this? The Fed has no choice here. If they want to beat inflation, they need to be ruthless. Finally, we still have too much speculation. Sure, the SPACs, those abominations, are being redeemed left and right. I say good riddance. The new ones are roundly booed, at least by me. But you think the Fed wants to see all these cryptocurrencies still dramatically higher? I'm sure Powell thinks that's nonsense. Could, could, could Bitcoin be going up because so much of it was wiped out by Sam Bankman Freed? No matter. Speculation must be crushed wherever it can be found, including those 200-odd coins that I think are worthless. Bottom line. Let Powell play for time. We'll get lower numbers, not necessarily a real slowdown, but lower numbers. We'll get more homes in the market. We'll get more resumes chasing fewer jobs. Just not yet, which is why Powell had, the, uh, had to do the obvious today. And when you do the obvious, not many investors get hurt, aside from the oblivious ones who somehow didn't see it coming. Hey, how about Barry in Florida, please, Barry? Hi, Jim. Booyah. Um, Booyah, what Barry. What's going on? Dominion Energy. Should I buy, sell, or hold? It's I think you should hold in Dominion. I mean, uh, look, it's not been a great one, obviously. It's come down tremendously. It yields 4.5%. But the problems there are not, I think, as, uh, as ugly as the stock price would indicate. Uh, I wish they'd come on, though, and walk us through it. I really do. How about we go to Mark in Wisconsin? Mark. Dr. Kramer, thank you for taking my call. Not a problem. I got... I got a, a bad stock here. My average price is like, say, 185. Uh, it's trading for north of $72 a share now. So my question is, do I buy more ticker PYPL or do I just hold on to the PayPal that I have? I want you to hold the on. The margins have been hurt here. I am not sure how quickly PayPal can come back because there were it, it had a growth rate that's dramatically decelerated, but it's still a good situation. It's just not a great situation. How about we go to Gus in Virginia? Gus. Jim, thank you for all you do for us out here in the retail world, oh, my friend. Thank you, buddy. Thank you very much. Let's go to work. 
My question is on a company that reported a great earnings beat last month. Uh, you had their CEO on the show, and you thought your takeaway was the stock should go much higher. But the last two weeks, it's down a lot. I'm wondering what's going on, and if you think Palo Alto Networks is still a buy. I like PANW. I like Nikesh Aurora. I think a lot of the high-profile, high-multiple, price earnings, multiple stocks have come down. But remember, he's done the pivot. They're profitable, and I think they're good. And I've got to tell you, I uh, did a lot of work on Data Dog. I said this morning uh, that, look, they're not making money. It's true, but their cash flow is great. And MongoDB may be best in show. So there's three that are working. All right. Pal had to do the obvious today. And when you do the obvious, not many people get hurt, okay? Aside from the oblivious ones who somehow didn't see it coming. Oh, man, buddy, tonight, you called in and stopped me on a couple of stocks. So I'm turning in my homework on Clearfield and Sotera Health. Then we're continuing our series on the best performance of 2022. I look at the consumer staples, and I'm sharing three names that I think could have a strong showing next year. And tomorrow, tomorrow is the CMC Investing Club monthly meeting at noon where we are helping club members get set for the new year. And I need you to join. I'll demonstrate what we do by answering some of the questions that would normally be reserved for tomorrow's meeting because we just got so many. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.